Okay. Will you look in there and make sure I'm in there just for a second? Yes, you are. I'm in there. And am I in there when I do this? Am I still in there? And I'm still in here over here? Yes, ma'am. Okay, perfect. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, welcome everybody for coming out on a rainy night. Like I, like I said, I thought I was going to kind of be alone. Mm -hmm. So the request was that I talk about fascia. Does anybody know what fascia is, even is? We got one yes. Awesome. Great. One person knows. Okay. So I did write what the roles are, but we'll talk about that in a second. Let's talk about fascia, like where you find it, what's the deal. So in our bodies, we have three layers of fascia. So there's three layers. There's a superficial, a middle, and a deep. Okay. So the superficial is if I peeled my skin off, I would have continuous fascia that's almost, it's like a webbing that's, if I took my skin off, I'd still be here if that was possible, you know? Because the superficial fascia is everywhere like an entire body sweater, okay? That's my superficial fascia. And that's when you're doing things like fascia blasters and things like that. That's working on that layer, okay? The middle layer is kind of interesting to me because the middle layer is around everything. So you have the middle layer is around every organ, it's around every bone, it's, a, it's everywhere and it's layers and layers and layers, right? So you have like, it, 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 it's even hard to describe because it's it's the same thing with different names in different places. So I have fascia around my kidneys, which is called renal fascia. I have fascia around the heart that's called your, the bag the heart is in is called the pericardium. That's fascia. I have fascia around my lungs. We know the name of that. That's pleura, right? Mm -hmm. What about bones? What? What's it called on bones? So on the bones, it's called periosteum. So it's periosteum around your bones. And the deal is, is that even your muscles are fascia. Your muscle is where they took, I don't know who took it, all right? <laughs> Whoever took it. But you have fascia, is, it's rolled, and this bundle is with the other rolled bundle and a bunch of rolled bundles, and that's rolled in fascia, which then that bundle, it's like braiding a braid into a braid. You know, you have all these rolls of fascia, rolled up fascia, is all rolled together and then it's bundled together and that bundle is inside another with another bundle until you're getting all those kind of muscle fiber tracks. So that's fascia as well and that's that that's that middle layer as well. Okay? So you have it everywhere. I also have fascia that's it like that goes inside for example my pelvis and I have I have layers and layers of it inside my pelvis as a container. That's a kind of a container. And the deepest layer of fascia, so the third and deepest layer, is a part of your cranial sacral system. It is, through, there are three layers of membranes, of fascial membranes, inside my head, connecting to all the bones of my head, and then it comes and anchors at the base of my skull and continues as the tube around my spine. Hmm. So it's, it's a continuous system. It then comes and connects and attaches on my sacrum. That's why it's called the cranial sacral system because these membranes include and connect to both of them. That's your deepest layer, okay? That is my deepest layer of membrane, of fascia. So fascia is kind of interesting because it has so many roles and people don't even realize why we have fascia or what it's doing or why is it so important. And I have to say for myself in the last, I don't know, I'd have to say about the last 10 years, maybe seven years, I've come to realize that fascia is like in some ways where it's at. You know, I've come to learn that in order to really help the body make changes, I have to have dialogue and begin to talk to the fascial system, okay? is because it's doing, not only is it doing so much as we're going to talk about the roles, but it just exists everywhere. It's everywhere. One of the things that really, and it's all interconnected, so it's, 
one of the things I have a really big passion for, although I don't teach it, but I have a passion to have it taught in my classes, are, is embryology. Mm -hmm. And so every training, I have a woman come in, she comes in from Portland, Oregon, and she teaches embryology. And one of the things in embry, there's so many, like it's, it's blow your mind stuff in embryology. Like how we develop is like the most, isn't it? It's like, it'll blow your mind. And um, <clears throat> embryologically, as you begin, as the cells, you know, you have the egg and the sperm come together, and then once conception happens, so you have this conceptus, and then what happens is within this conceptus, you get the cells dividing, right? They just keep dividing until they get to 64 of them in the same size space. Once they do that, the cells start to migrate into patterns, okay? And once all of that starts to happen, the migrations and the patterns and all this stuff start to happen, you become a three-layered thing. And it is in that one layer, one of the layers, that all of this fascia and muscle is all going to develop, which is why it is all interconnected and interrelated, because it all started out as the same layer. It just begins to develop and move and become different things and go around different things, right? Mm -hmm. So one layer becomes like your organs and one layer becomes all your fascia and muscle and bone and one layer becomes your neural, right? So your nervous system. So you have this other, si you have the system that become, it wraps itself around everything else as the developing is happening which is a whole different way of looking at it than going, I have a piece of fascia over here, and I have a piece of fascia <laughs> over here. And you know, this whole interconnectedness, it's a huge, it's a huge kind of interconnected system that we have, that we are, and that's one of the most important, one of the things that I feel is like most important is to when you look at the body, when you're thinking about it and studying it, hey, hi, Lori. Hi, guys. Hi. All right. Anywhere, Laura. Hi, Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm all right, right. thanks. Yeah. Hey. You look really good. Oh, good. I, I look good. <laughs> <good. laughs> How are you? Hi. You know me. I start on. You know how I am. Yeah. 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 So anyway, so so it's that whole embryological factor. Hi. Come on in. Hi. Hi. Come come take a seat. Here, let me get my coat off. Wow. All righty. Come take a seat. All right. For the newcomers, each of you are going to say what I just said. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, my. Yeah. Ready? Okay, we're ready. We're ready to go. Hi. So, what I, just as a very quick recap, I just said that there's three layers of fascia in the body. We're talking about fascia today. So, there's three layers of fascia in the body, and one of the things I was just describing is not only which, where they are, superficial, middle, that's around everything, and deep, which is the cranial sacral system. But also, I was just saying to everybody that the embryologically, embryologically that there is one of the layers of us as we develop that actually is your fascia, your muscles, and your bones. And that is that layer makes all the fascia, the muscles, and the bones, and the body, so it is all interconnected. So there's an interconnection between everything in the body. And the superficial layer of fascia connects to the middle layer, and the middle layer connects to the deepest layer. And the interesting thing about that is, is that there's always this relationship that's going on between all the levels of the self, always, always. Everybody with me so far? Mm -hmm. Good? Okay. So fascia <laughs> looks like a web. So, it, you know, here's the deal. Fascia looks, when you have a piece of chicken, you know, the little white filmy stuff that's between them, that's fascia, mm -hmm. okay? That's that middle layer of fascia. And fascia looks like a web, but it's semi-viscous, meaning that it's not a complete solid. So fascia is not a complete solid. It is semi-viscous. So that's gonna play a role when I start to describe 
something this so remember that it's semi viscous and that <clears throat> that is very important when you understand the workings of it the literal physiological workings of it so one of the things here's my here's my list of role the roles of fashion so one of the things it does is it maintains structural inter integrity and you can understand that because it's actually everywhere for example I'll give you an example Inside my thorax here, I have two lungs and a heart, and each of those organs has fascia around it, okay? And then, well actually there's three layers around your lungs, three layers of fascia around your lungs so that the lungs can expand in the, in the cavity. But around all of my lungs, then there's another layer that holds, every, that's holds everything together inside. So I have that abdominally, I have that thoracically, I have that where it's holding things together and keeping a structural integrity. At the same time, fascia is a support system. Do you ever see anybody walking down the street where you see them sort of like this or some weird position in their body and you're thinking to yourself, how did they stay that way? That's because the fascia will lock itself down in order to make support for that person. So that person can maintain support. You, it will help maintain support in your body. I don't think I know anybody who isn't have some sort of something where they're off in their bodies. And fascia will tighten itself down in order to help keep that support. It also <laughs> is protection. So one of the best examples of the protection to, uh, <clears throat> of fascia is that in the cranial sacral system, and I said that there's three layers of fa three layers of fascia. The outermost layer of fascia in the cranial sacral system it's called the dura, and it's very thick and has tensile strength. So it's definitely incredibly protective for your brain and spinal cord. So there's a real big role of protection in, in this cranial sacral system, but in the fascia. I'm going to talk about how it becomes a shock absorber. Okay? I'm going to talk about that a little bit. <clears throat> Hemodynamic processes. What this means is, is that inside your fascia, it has a pulsation in it. Okay? It has, a, it has an intrinsic pulsation within itself. And that pulsation is what helps, besides, everybody always thinks it's all muscle contraction that gets lymphatic and blood to move up your body, right? So that all my blood and my lymphatics will all move back up. But in reality, what's actually also helping, that's like a duo system, is that this pumping that's happening in my fascia that's intrinsic in it helps pump up the blood and lymph, or pump it down my arms, to the back to the torso, back up to where all the blood and lymph actually return. Everybody gets that? It's kind of an interesting feel. <clears throat> it has a role in defense. This semi-viscous state, there is a, you know, I don't know if I could really explain how the defense works, but it has, uh, it has sort of a biochemical aspect to it that will keep out pathogens and keep things out within the fascia. <clears throat> One of the things, communication and exchange. You, have, you actually have hormones and electrical stuff going through your fascia. So you want your fascia to be like, I want my fascia to be move, movable and moving so that it's actually sending this hormonal and bio and uh, electrical exchange that needs to happen in it because that it should happen there. So, and then it's that same in that biomechanical process where that pumping is happening that's helping other processes to actually happen. Poor little fascia doesn't like get much <laughs> attention, does it? It's like work my muscles. Come on, you know, that kind of thing. So, can I erase this? Yes. Good. Okay, good. Because, here's the next part. So, one of the things that I just taught in the class that just started is the fact that, is the fact that the body is organized, okay? So these embryological layers I was talking about, there's a blueprint, and they are laying themselves down in this blueprint. 
That is what's happening. So one of the deals is, is of course my fascia is also organized. So I, which I think is actually pretty interesting and it's very telling when you're looking at, when someone comes in to see me and they're telling me what's going on with them, I want to think about all the maps that I have in my head and one of them is how the fascia is organized. So I'll pick the two mo that I think are the most interesting. No, you can move it there. So this is a, a chart that shows fascia running up the side of the body. All the way from my foot, right? All the way from my foot, see how it goes all the way up to my head, right? This is called the lateral chain of fascias, right? And you can see that it's, you can either go from the top down or from the bottom up. And it's really getting the whole side of my body. This fascia is going all the way up and all the, it's all the way connected, right? So what happens when I sprain my ankle? Going all the way up. Going all the way up to my head, isn't it? It's going to go all the way up. And this is one of the IT band. Everybody's like very familiar with the IT band over here that's connecting right here. Is the biggest shock absorber in the body. So that IT band, every step you take is taking the shock, it's absorbing the shock of walking or running. Okay? So that's happening there in this that's what it's there for. So this whole idea that my IT band, you know, a lot of PTs and things have a tendency <laughs> to roll people. I say that it's quietly over there. Is <clears throat> have a tendency to have people. We have some, you know, we whatever in the room, and uh, and they'll roll them on the IT band to try to get the IT band to let go. When in actuality, your IT band is just in response to something that's happening from here to here. Yeah. Something's happening from there to there. So there's some, whether it's a hip is out, or whether I've got a liver that's really congested, or my jaw, I have TMJ, it's all going to go all the way down. You see this? Mm -hmm. So it's important to really understand how fascia is laid down and how it's organized. Okay? So this is, this is one piece of how it's organized. I'm going to show you this one because this one's one of my faves. So that was called the lateral line of fascia. And this is called the deep front line. So notice how the deep front line is deep. The, all your organs are taken out, right? So it's behind, it's behind the organs. You see that? You guys can see that. It's behind the organs. And it goes down the inside of the leg. Can you see how it goes down the inside of the leg here? It goes, it's all inside this, right? So here's the deal. Everybody loves to talk about their hip flexor muscle, right? Everybody talks about that hip flexor. So this is the fascia on the hip flexor right here. Your hip flexor is deep to your organs, and it comes and it connects on the very top of your leg. But it almost like becomes part of also the other tissues and muscles and fascia that's in my inner leg. Okay? Everybody still with me? Mm -hmm. So I've got, I've got all this fascia below my organs coming in here, coming into my hips, coming inside my legs, and going down the insides of my legs. Here's the deal with this. This is how interconnected everything is. Who, what, what lives on the top of my hip flexor? Laura? What lives on the top, who lives on the top of my hip flexor? Hip flexor? Kidneys. The kidneys. The kidneys live on your hip flexor. And almost, they, I just read an article not too long ago that said almost everybody in the culture has some kind of tension in their kidneys. Kidneys that are not like processing and working well. So if I have, and this is, I'm so good at this, this is going to lead me into my next thing, <laughs> is that if I have tension in my kidneys, it's going to make tension in my fascia and in my hip flexor. You get that? Yes. It's gonna make tension in my fascia, then it'll go into my hip flexor, and it'll go right down. Then it goes down into my hip flexor, then where does it go? Right in between my legs. So if I have tension in my kidneys, it's tensioning me all inside the back wall, and this is inside the back wall. So what's it gonna do? 
It's going to give me back pain on whichever side I have tension on, whichever kidney. That's going to give me back pain. Okay? And if we go with, which I do, because I've been doing this a long time, is the French doctor who actually figured out that organs create most pain in the body. So you could be feeling it in your shoulder or you could be feeling it somewhere else and he believes that 65, 70 percent, 65 to like 90 percent of all pain in your muscles is coming out of your organs. So all he there say he is saying that that higher percentage is actually coming out of your organs. And over the years, I have to tell you, I believe it. Is that organ pain? There's maps for organ pain. So if I have kidney tension, I'm getting pain in my low back and I'm getting something happening down in here. Something's going to happen. I might start looking like I have knock need because it starts to it starts to draw me together. It starts to draw my legs together towards the midline and the tension. So everybody get that? Yes. You see how that can work? Yes. So fascia is an interesting deal. So based on what I just said, here's the deal. Is that since fascia is surrounding everything, every organ, every muscle, every bone, everything, there's a few things like some nerves that don't have it, but basically fascia is around every single thing. And here's my deal. So if I have my, here's my kidney, right? And my kidney gets some kind of dysfunction in it. And my kidney is sitting on my psoas muscle here that kind of goes into my hip here kind of merges in, this is the muscle here, right? What I just described is, is that if I have dysfunction in my kidney, it will eventually create dysfunction in whatever my neighbor is. I don't care if my neighbor is a muscle. I don't care if my neighbor is another organ. I don't care if my neighbor is a bone or a nerve or a blood vessel, eventually, my dysfunction is going to make it go into dysfunction. You know, I always think of that, I always think of that crazy commercial where, and they tell two friends, and they tell two friends, because that's what happens in dysfunction in the body, is if left alone and left not being helped by someone, or you don't change your nutrition, or you don't get chiropractic care, or PT care, or body work care, or whatever it is, what will end up happening is, is that now my kidney gets stuck to my psoas. So what's going to happen is eventually my entire psoas is going to lock up, right? So the things that can happen out of that is that <clears throat> my psoas is attached to the front of my lumbar spine. So I might have something happen in my lumbar, in my vertebrae down there, because this guy attaches to them all, right? To the, all, to the lumbars. So if the fascia is getting stuck to the kidney. Yep. Okay. And you take care of releasing the fascia, the yep. kidney's still not well. Right. Okay. Well, you have to make sure that you release the kidney or whatever knee, however the kidney needs to get addressed. Okay. You know, whether you're treating the kidney as a body work person or you're having whatever with your medical institution, is that yes, because the kidney has to get Otherwise, what's going to happen is if you release the fascia and the kidney is not released, it's coming back. Exactly. It's coming right back. And that's the deal. So that's why in this sort of looking at the body as a whole, you kind of got to, give me a second, Laura, you got you to gotta like look at all the parts because if I just do this and I don't do that, that, even though that may not have been the original, is going to make that go back. You see that? It's going to make it go back even though it wasn't like your original issue. Yeah, Lori. Um, I've experienced like so a lot of people that have the trauma from whatever accidents they have is is it the trauma from the hip or is it the kidney? Like, how do you say you see more of it as an organ issue? Right. So a lot of people have injuries. And the Absolutely. Stuck. Absolutely. But while you're working, do you mostly see it as an organ? Oh uh, well, I. Or you kind of go back in like because I know I don't have as much experience as you do, but I'm always second guessing like, is this really the organ or is it 
from the accident of the trauma causing well, the fascia, causing problems in the kidney? Well, that's a great, that's a good question. I mean, she's asking who, like chicken or egg is what okay. she's asking. By the time they get to you, it doesn't matter. Okay. By the time they get to you, it doesn't matter who was the starter. It does in the sense that you want to make sure that there's a resolution for it. But you've got to do the kidney and the, the kidney, the fascia, the psoas, the hip. You got to do it all because now it's all started. And usually by the time we see somebody, we who are the body work people see somebody, they've had it a long time. So it is now involved like a long, a lot of stuff along the way. So it's not just like, you know, I used to think when I first started out in doing body work, I used to think, oh yeah, just that one thing, and then they're fine. <laughs> it's like, there's never, there's never one thing. And you know, I just had, I just had a young woman today who her deal was is that, Here's her neck, and here's her nose is on the front, and she's supposed to sit on her, you know, this is her nose, and she's supposed to sit like this, right, with her spine coming up and the vertebrae coming up in the middle of the bottom of the head, mm -hmm. pretty much. But she, during her birth, got this, this. Mm -hmm. So she was way forward. So when you felt her at the back of the, you know, at the back of the head, you hit a vertebrae like right away. You should have a little bit of room before that happens. So he hit a vertebrae right away. Well now what's happened for her, because she's 22 or something like that, is not only did she have the origin of that, but that's how it started. But now she has the kind of neck tension that never goes away, that leads also into her upper back, also into her sternum, and so all the parts kind of had to get taken away. But the other thing is, is that I did a maneuver with her today, which was the, probably the best one I've ever done on her over the years. And um, I did the maneuver, and once the maneuver happened, her, trust me, I've worked on her a long time, is it moved back into the center, but it revealed, oh my God, what was underneath it was a vertebrae, a first cervical vertebrae that was rotated like in a way that was, and she always has this like constant pain down the left hand side, and but she, underneath that, so I had to get it decompacted, the vertebrae off of her head, and when it did, it rotated even worse, like in this terrible position. So it's like, oh my, I said to her, oh my God, underneath that was underneath this, and this was underneath that. So that is the kind of the way it works, especially in dysfunction, is that you're rarely working on the one thing. You know, you're working on the compilation that's happened. So one of the deals that happens with fascia is fascia, as I said, is this semi-viscous, right? But what happens to fascia when it gets, you know, dysfunction is it turns crystalline. Mm -hmm. It crystallizes. So when it crystallizes, that's what's the sticking thing. Mm -hmm. That's what makes my kidney and, and renal fascia stick to my psoas. That's what does it, is that this this semi-viscous substance, ground substance, now turns into something that's getting a little more solid, but the way it's getting solid is it's crystallizing. And so it's super sticky, and it sticks to its neighbor. And because everything in the body is wrapped in fascia, hello, <laughs> I'm sticking to you, and then eventually, once we're stuck, the second structure within the fascia will begin to have Issues over time. It takes it takes a long time. Well, but what you, exactly causes the stick? I mean, why does it start to crystal? <laughs> what is happening within the fascia itself that the fascia goes? Oh, I need to change my form. Well, it needs. It starts to change its form because, say, you've got this dysfunction in the kidney. Say somebody is having a lot of. Um, you know, taking a lot of medication or something, and the kidney has to overwork and overwork and overwork, you know. And what'll happen is, is that in that overwork, you have neurological input into the kidney, more neurological input into the kidney, which will eventually change the fascia. So that changes the fascia, then it changes its neighbor's fascia, and then we're stuck together. And then, but I have to tell you, it just keeps cascading until something stops it. 
you know, until something comes in to stop it, which is why eventually you start to see people start to get like shorter and stuck her together -er and, you know, and walking, you know, because, and walking, like shuffling walking and stuff like that, because it takes over time, your fascia is solidifying and you are solidifying. So as wonderful as the support and protection is that it's doing for you, at the same time in dysfunction, it's starting to stick you together. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a way different way to sort of think about this and, and look at this. So, you know, one of the things is, of course, you know, body work, because that's where I'm coming from, but at the same time, you know, walking, exercise, moving, getting moving, and starting getting the pumping together in whatever way one can. I don't always think that one size fits all. So if you like to ride your bike, go for it. Or if you like to hike, do that, you know, whatever it is, if you can walk up and down your block, perfect, you know, or around your house six times, whatever it is, it's like you got to get moving. You got to get moving. You know, I, I was in a workshop a hundred years ago down in Florida and the guy had a big, it was one of the early ones and probably 32 years ago, and he had this big banner up that movement was life. And I was like, all right, I can go there. I can go there, definitely. Anybody have any questions? Nope. All right. I guess I just got to make up some more things. So, the, the, okay. So now we understand. We now we understand the the adhesion property, right? That, that things will adhere together, and the it starts to create more less function. Let's say that way. Let it creates less function in the body. Mm -hmm. But what happens actually when I have to have say I have to have a surgery or something? Right? So they're cutting through all the layers. And I'm bringing this up now in this context of fascia, in the fascia talk a bit, because there's a difference between things adhesing and, and scar tissue. There's a difference between them, okay? So that, and so, so adhesion versus scar tissue, I think is an important, you know, thing to think about, well, for me and for some of us. But, so we just talked about all of the adhesion and how that's happening. <coughs> and that, and here's the deal with adhesions, is that when fascia is stuck and it's in that crystalline, more contracted state, one of the things that can help it to go to be more normalized is actually well, pressure or something helping it to come apart, right? Most of the time it's pressure because, you know, when, when it's stuck like that, its energy is, is trapped. And so what do you do with energy? You, you apply that sort of, you know, slow, either sustained pressure or you can do other kinds of things that I do that actually create heat to come in and takes it back into its semi-viscous form. So it's not that it goes crystalline and it can never go back. It's that it goes crystalline and then you have to help it back, right? You have to help it come back from that. So it's an interesting kind of deal. And is the help only always manual or can it be nutritional or? I think it's part nutritional, I think it's part get moving, and I think it's part manual. I do. I think it's all of that. I usually think that there's, you know, pieces of it that are still stuck that actually have to be manually done. But if somebody has some kind of disease process or something like that, then what's going to happen is, is that even if you manually let it go, you're helping them maintain, you know, there's a difference between helping somebody maintain and helping somebody through something, right? So you know, you may be looked at because with a disease process, it's going to keep that fascia going like that. So you could help treat them and help them, and then they come back and they're in the same place, but that's because there's some process, you know, that's in a disease process that's going on within them that cr keeps creating this. So, you know, I'm real clear with my people who I can see the difference between that is that I'm helping you maintain 
we're and we're going to get you as healthy as possible. But then we'll know when we reach that place that you know, as opposed to you're actually going to be climbing out of this. There's those stages of health. There's those there's stages of health adaptation. I just put that in. We just put it on your thing. Adaptation, compensation. And when somebody gets the level of the health piece that's degeneration, then that's the part you can't like help them back up to the back up to the adaptation or the compensation levels, which are the levels you want to be at. You want to be able to adapt if something happens and adapt yourself out of it, or you want to have where something ha something's happening. You're carrying a lot of issues, and you can comp you can make compensation. You can still do that without starting to degenerate in it. So. Kind of, an, it's kind of a, the body is so friggin' fascinating to me. It is so interesting the abilities that it has and the ability to heal itself, you know. But a lot of times the the part about healing that's often, and I'm saying this coming from a body work place, is that there's also the body, mind, spirit. It's not just one thing. So if I'm if I'm someone who's like really negative or I really, you know, don't have a good connection with others, then all of that's playing out in me, whether or not, like, I want to help, it's playing out in somebody, whether or not I have the intentions to help you or whatever. It's, that part's there too. So, on that note, let's talk about scar tissue, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, because, yeah. let's go, let's go to scar tissue. All right, so, scar tissue, is all about like if you've had a surgery or you've had some kind of a big cut or a gash or a, something happens where there's some cut through the tissues, okay? And what happens with scar tissue is that you know, origi originally your tissue was all laying down, remember I said it's organized. So originally your tissue is laying down in a very organized manner. And especially, let's just say this is muscle, haha, -ha, fascial tissue, not great? So let's say this is muscle here. And muscle knows, the only thing a muscle knows is to be on or off. It needs to, it knows that it's like either the muscle's contracted or it's relaxed. That's all a muscle knows. It's like one of those, you know, we put so much on muscles in our culture, it's stunning to me and the muscles are the most simple one of the more simple parts of our body it either is contracted to do something or it's relaxed or it stayed contracted because there's something going on but that's all it really knows okay so say I and the muscle fibers run in a, in a direction here but say what happens is I cut through, it gets cut through for some reason Okay? The fascia and the muscle, whatever, gets cut through. What happens is, is that the body gets signaled to say, we have a breach. We have a breach in room 11. You know, send help. So what happens is, is that it starts to send connective tissue. But, I mean, the great thing and the not so great thing is that when it sends connective tissue, it sends it connective tissue to help the breach. But now, instead of me having all these fibers that do this, I now have this. Mm -hmm. And I don't have that. Do you get me? Mm -hmm. I don't have that. So what I've got is pretty much a mass of fibers there. And that's one of the things that is so important in when you have any kind of surgeries or something happened where it's creating a scar in there is that to have somebody come and work on it you know the rule of thumb with working on anybody's scar tissue and doing anything is six weeks a break a surgery a whatever the rule of thumb tends to be six weeks and then you're okay to do it so one of the deals you want to go do here is you're coming in to break this down to try to help it get as organized as possible. Over here, you have some dysfunction that created this. You get me? You get the difference? This one is where you have a mass and you definitely, 
You def I just had a young girl that just had um, baby is maybe six weeks old or something like that and she yep maybe must be six weeks old because she made her appointment with me like postpartum six weeks bang ding and um, I had forgotten that she had had the baby with a c-section mm. I wanted oh ooh, ooh, this is so great so I had forgotten that I had that she had a c-section right so the c-section of course is cutting cutting her here right so she got cut there for the baby and she had one inside of her leg was filled with fluid at the top right here okay because that will happen and I'll, I'll explain it to you in a second so she had this scar and what also had happened why it was so bad on the right hand side was when the doctor sewed her after that she had the baby he like pulled her too thick on the right hand side so the scarring felt like the size of my finger on the right hand side and the size of my pinky on the left and what was happening is is the fluid was not able to go back up through the pelvic floor where all the extra scar tissue was here and when I when I went in she was telling me that what she told me was is that she felt really hard at the bottom here of her belly she was still larger from being pregnant and I went on there and what had happened was is that all the fascia got adhesed of her abdomen in a weird way that I've not seen before got adhesed and around her small intestines and hooked it into the scar so we had the double whammy going on here she had both the scar and she had adhesions coming from here and once I went in and let the scar go and then broke up the adhesions around her small intestine her leg you actually saw her leg gets smaller not all the way but you saw the fluid go back up and in scars and adhesions guys I mean if so we have many people here who are not body workers so the, the moral of that story is go get work you know, even if you go a couple of times a year, two or three, you feel I'm healthy and I'm moving, you know, it's great. I still think you should go get body work just to make sure that it's all kind of going and moving, you know, and because there's a real, you know, there becomes a buildup of stuff and it's so much harder to get out the buildup of stuff over time than it is to get it out as a sort of a regular kind of maintenance and the maintenance doesn't have to be every week I'm not a believer in that anyway in the first place but you know something where it comes a couple times a year something like once a quarter you know something like that to really start to get this stuff moving and also to take out so that you're not building because this I mean this doesn't happen very often does it I mean does for some people it happens, for others it doesn't. You know, I, I, I rarely have a person in my chair that hasn't had a surgery um, when they come in to see me. And most people have, not all, but most. But this, almost everybody's got this. Mm -hmm. This one. Every, almost everybody's got adhesions coming. Almost everybody. So if, you know, I'll just give you a one or two examples and then you can ask me questions or whatever is that if I'm congested in my liver which hello you know <laughs> hello almost everybody is congested in their liver the the pain pattern for your liver is your right shoulder and your right neck mm -hmm. and into your right hip makes a long leg on the right usually makes a long leg on the right hand side that's a pain, that's when my liver is congested my liver does that you know yes my pancreas on the left will give me left shoulder left neck and left SI pain but the interesting thing about the pancreas I just remembered or thought of this is that you know your pancreas is the one that's putting insulin out and blood sugar and all of that insulin and anti-insulin very delicate organ all of the fascia of your body is connected to your pancreas and therefore all and you're it you're innervated by your T9 your vertebrae T9 so all the fascia of the body is coming and attaching there so you keep wondering why you have 
like something going on there or you have something in the hip or and it's chronically comes back that's the other piece you go to somebody and you go to a massage therapist or I'm sorry a chiropractor or you go to something you go to somebody and if it chronically comes back then there's a missing piece you know and oftentimes it's an organ most of the time or it's the, or it's the nervous system or it's, the, or it's the fight or flight nervous system that's got something in it that keeps that keeps that coming back because that will happen too. So have I totally confused you? No. I have a question. Okay. The fascia that would be connected to the liver would that affect the jaw? No. No. Not not directly. Of course. I mean, here's the deal. If I have the fascia around my liver, you know, my liver's congested and the fascia around my liver gets involved and my liver lives here on the right hand side and a little bit to the left. It's front to back right here and then becomes narrower towards the front on this side, okay? So here's the deal. If I have something going on with my liver and it starts to draw me this way, I mean, I've already got stuff from a car accident on my neck and stuff that you can see, but if I start to get drawn forward, mm -hmm. where's my jaw going? My jaw is going to be, your jaw is only hinged by ligaments. This is only hanging by ligaments. So if I'm off in my, in my, the way my body is supposed to be organized, my lines of gravity and stuff, my jaw is the one that's going to actually move, it's going to do stuff because it's just hanging there. And if I'm out here, it's not hanging well, okay? But that's, but it's an indirect one. It's an indirect one for the jaw. You have more fascial stuff in these fascial pieces that I'm showing you, lateral line and that stuff. There's a few that also, I didn't bring them all over here, but there's some that, um, if you look at this, this is the rectus abdominis. Look how it hooks into the jaw. Yeah. You see that? Mm -hmm. this, is the, the, this is the fascia on the muscle of your abdomen, right? And you can see that it directly comes and hooks into your jaw. So I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to be doing crunches. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to be doing crunches, Nan? Most of the time, crunches are the wrong thing to do anyway, mm -hmm. because they always say, you know, your back is weak, so therefore you should strengthen your, your front. Well, most people are too over tight here. Mm -hmm. They're too over tight here. So, and they're, they're actually weak back here because they're a little too stretched out or something. Mm -hmm. And so you actually want them to do a whole different story than any kind of, you know, crunch stuff. Okay, so maybe a scar tissue in, the, in that area would definitely affect this because you wouldn't be getting that. Okay. Yes, definitely. So did everybody understand what, uh, Wendy, is that you? Lori. Lori, I don't know what. Hello. Hey, Lori. Lori, Lori and Lori. Is, I don't know why I went there. Is that, did you hear what she said? Is that, so she, after showing this line here, she's saying that scar tissue here in, in the, you know, like a C-section or a hysterectomy or something, down here will pull in the jaw. Yes. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. It's a, you know, it's, the, it, once, you know, the weird thing is the body is elegant and simple at the same time while being incredibly complex. There's an elegance to this and there's a simplicity to how this is all going together, how this all goes. And at the same time, it's incredibly complex. And it saddens me that our medical system has gotten to where everybody's just being you know, where they're doing something where it's gotten very myopic and I'm only looking at this, right? I had, a, I had a woman who every single one of her symptoms was absolutely connected and she had a doctor for each and every single one. And, but it was, all, every, every one of them was connected, but it was, it was, it's an interesting, interesting deal. And it's why you are all sitting here today is because that doesn't work that way that well. So we have to bring back, because this is what old medicine was, is we have to bring this back where we're looking much more holistically and understanding ourselves and having someone who understands how it all kind of works and goes together. I'm just super grateful that I went down that path. Yeah. So in my brain, it's all connected. Yes. So 
If I'm standing at the elephant in the front and I see the trunk, if I stand on the side, it looks different. I look at the rear, it's all interconnected. So how do you know where to start? That is like an awesome question, isn't it? Like, it's because Lori, I didn't say this, but Lori graduated out of the first class. So we have yay. first class, yay, Lori, yay. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so how do you know where to start? Well, this is the way I do it. So we might have 18, I don't know how many of you, you are in here, but we might have 17 or 18 different ways of start of where you think to start. And, you know, in one sense, none of them are wrong. Right. But in my, you know, I was taught, oh my God, I was taught this whole hierarchy of the way you, when I was in osteopathic school, of the way you do this hierarchy, right? And I kind of go by that and I kind of don't, but you want to know what the funny thing is? It's just saying this, in this hierarchy, in several of the, besides the osteopathic that I did, whatever, several years ago, uh, when I, one of the very first modalities I ever learned 33 years ago told, said the same thing, that scar tissue is the number one thing you always work on somebody. Number, un, numero uno. And the reason why is because not only is it unorganized, and so it starts to pull you. I had a guy one time, he, he had this neck pain, and this was early, early, I was young. I was a young massage therapist back then. And he had this neck pain, and I like, did his neck the way I know to do his neck, and then I did the front of his neck the way I know to do that, and then, I don't know, I didn't know anything else to do because his neck hurt. So then one day, I'm, you know, I think he came to me twice, and the second time, I was looking at his hand, and he had a scar. I said, well, I don't know, let me work your scar, because I didn't know what to do. <laughs> and I worked his scar, and his neck pain went away. Now, i got to say, that was like miracle stuff, because that's not usual. But I worked the scar on his finger, and it had tracked up the fascia right to his neck on the right-hand side. So how do you know what to work first? You know, in my teachings, I teach these guys what's most rigid. So what's most rigid is the first thing, is, you know, because that, because that thing has the most energy stuck in it. And what's most rigid may not have been the original thing that started it, but it's the bigger, biggest holder now. It's the biggest holder now. So, and I would say that when I'm working, I probably do organs. I've, I see six people a day now, and I probably do organs at least five times. Uh, you know, on everybody. And this thing, because you know your adrenal glands live on your kidneys, right? Mm -hmm. So you, those people, some people know this, your adrenal glands, which have your cortisol and adrenaline, these hormones, they're living on your kidneys. Remember, they're next, they're like a little hat on your kidney and your little piece of soap there. And it's like, hello, you know, how much of us are over firing horribly? in our adrenal glands, you know, just terribly. It's the nature of the culture and the world right now is to have that stress constantly pumping. So therefore, your adrenal glands are gonna be getting it and they're gonna get your kidneys for sure. But your kidneys are doing, they're doing some major work, man. 60% of your blood is going through your kidneys every minute, every minute. So it's filtering constantly. Yeah, Jane? On scar tissue, I know you get scar tissue when something is cut. Mm -hmm. Is there any other way that your body creates scar tissue? You know, you can get scar tissue on an impact. Okay. You can get scar tissue. You can get an area where you get lots of micro tears or tears within the tissues that don't open an entire thing, but you can get it on an, <laughs> on an impact. Okay. Yeah. Does it matter how old the scar tissue is? That is a super great question. Um, the older the scar tissue, the, the more the body has laid down layers of it. So what happens when you're working old scar tissue is that, I mean, you, you're not reaching for the deepest layer. That is not, the, the body won't let you anyway. So the body won't let you. So you're working this, the, the more surfacey of the layers, couple of the layers. And then after you get finished, the body will work its next layer up, okay? So it lays down like, you know, like uh, sometimes they show you the strata of the earth and stuff like that. So it lays them down, but the ones that are scar tissue that's closer to the, that's the original one part that's down there is almost like 
it's ischemic, so meaning that it doesn't have any like juice in it, no mm -hmm. blood going on in it. So what's happening is it gets more like it will be more dried or harder or strap-like is what ends up happening. So it does, and the longer it's in there, the more it's laid down, more layers, and the more it's stuck to everybody around. So it's like you're peeling off layers in an onion. Yep. Yes, down, yes. But gently, the body will tell you, don't do that. Right, the body will tell you when to stop. Yeah. That's if you're listening. I mean, if you're not listening, you can keep going, man. And you've got that person writhing on the table and doing all that stuff. And there is, working scar tissue is painful. Yeah. Scar tissue is not for sissies, man. It is painful. It is. You won't ever get rid of it entirely. Though. Usually not. Okay. Usually not. And, you know, the body is using some element of the scar tissue for support. So you got to remember that. You know, sometimes the very thing that you're trying to help is the very thing that you have to be careful because you have to leave, you have to know, like, you do not want to destabilize a body that's using some of the scar tissue for support or for, you know, um, protection or for organizing. You know, you, have, you, kind of, you kind of get the feel for how much you let go, how much you don't, that kind of thing. Yeah. It's an, it, you know, it's all an, kind of an interesting deal. And as I say to all my students, the treatment plan is in the body. So your treatment plan and yours 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 is all different. There is no one size fits all. This crazy stuff, you know, a diet book is what worked for that guy, for that person who wrote the diet book. You know what I mean? So it's like we as individuals, no matter what field we're in, we need to be flexible. We need to have that, that kind of give and take and actually have a depth of listening that lets you listen to what is going on as opposed to, I've made my mind up, what you need. Yeah, doesn't that suck? Don't you hate when somebody tells you what you need? Your body doesn't want that either just because your body's, you know, your body is, your body is your body and it knows, it knows what it wants and how much it wants or whatever. You're hoping that someone like myself or Lori or Brandy or Alyssa, when she's all done, when these guys are done, is that you're hoping that they're good listeners too because that's a big thing for me is, is that how do you listen as opposed to how do you self-impose. It's a very different way of coming to this and coming to healing, you know. That is very different. Anybody else? Look at me. Five, four, no. <laughs> <laughs> really, I, I, honest to God, oh, I probably shouldn't say this on the camera, but honest to God, at a quarter or two, I thought, oh my God, I don't have anything to say. And I did think that for a moment. <laughs> I did think that. So, once again, the, it's really funny because the person who wanted to hear about fascia is not here. <laughs> she was a lady that said, please talk about fascia, and she's not here. So, if you have any thoughts or any ideas about something you'd like to hear about, um, I will be next month, you know, second Wednesday of the month. I'll be right here doing this crazy dance. But if there's something you think yours was too amorphous, what you asked me for, but you know, but if there's something structural, you know, or whatever that I can do, I'd be happy to do that. So you can either let me know or you can go on the Facebook page, Ancrum Institute, and message me or post, you know, I always post almost every day there something about the body so please feel free and thank you so much for coming i thought i was going to be alone thank you thank you thank you, thank you.